This is Run Jump Stomp, gaming news for the week of April 7th, 2015. I'm Bill, your host. This week, we'll be talking about the Nintendo Direct from April 1st, HBO and Twitch getting together, OnLive is shutting down and taking things away from you, the long play, wishlisted, and more. All coming up on Run Jump Stomp. Just a real quick, I want to go over the information that Nintendo released during their April 1st Nintendo Direct. Uh, they opened up with Mewtwo footage. Uh, so they're going to be adding Mewtwo to the game uh, April 15th if you own both the Wii U version as well as the 3DS version. Uh, if you don't have both of them, then you could buy Mewtwo for four dollars on april 28th so that'll give people who bought both versions a little extra time with them as a reward uh, they're also going to be including balancing and some sharing functionality as well as some costumes for me's uh, there was also a surprise release of a new character lucas who is from mother three um, I've never actually played using Lucas, so I'm not sure if, if he's just a reskin of Ness. I, I think it might be, but I'm not sure. Um, at the end, it showed like he was hanging from a snake. It was weird. I wasn't sure how that... Um, if, if that means he has a different move set than Ness or not. Um, in June, Smash Brothers will have a fighter ballot, so users can pick the next character. Uh, they showed Cat Mario, so it seems like are they just going to be uh, skins for currently existing characters. Which by itself is fine, as long as they're not uh, super expensive. I probably won't buy any skins for characters. However, if they start actually releasing uh, new, full new characters, uh, I'd probably spend some money on that. Uh, my question is, if you buy the DLC, do you get the content on both devices uh, moving forward. My guess is probably because that's what they're doing with Mewtwo. So when Nintendo posted a link on their Facebook page linking to the character ballot, they said it'd be great if you um, vote for your favorite Nintendo character. A lot of people were wondering, does that mean that you can't vote for third party characters? Uh, after that, um, Various companies came forward and said that they were interested in getting their third-party characters in Smash. Phil Spencer of Microsoft said that he wants to get Banjo-Kazooie in there. WayForward wants Shantae from Shantae in the Pirate's Curse. Um, Yacht Club wants um, Shovel Knight in there. And Konami uh, retweeted something about wanting Snake in DLC. Um, later on, after people were like, were wondering what's a f Nintendo's official stance on this, uh, someone emailed them and their response was, Thanks for writing to us. I can certainly understand your interest in if third-party characters are eligible for the Smash Brothers fighter ballot. I want to assure you that we are able to submit, that you are able to submit any video game character for this ballot. While we were unable to guarantee your suggested character will become a Super Smash Brothers fighter, rest assured, we do take all feedback into consideration. So it seems like they're willing to allow third-party characters in. That begs the question, which third-party characters are you hoping for? Uh, the next thing that they talked about was they are releasing Wave 4 for Amiibo on May 29th. They are still doing retailer exclusivity, so that means it's going to be really, really difficult to get any, or not any, but get some of these Amiibo. Um, they also talked about N Amiibo Tap, which is a new game coming out. It has, um, it's called Nintendo's Greatest Bits, and basically you take your Amiibo, you tap it to your uh, Wii U or maybe 3DS. I'm not sure if they, I don't think they showed both but you tap your amiibo and it unlocks a three minute game like a gameplay highlights kind of like a demo but it's restricted to three minutes 
And each time that you tap the amiibo, I think that it randomly picks a three minute scene from a game that that character's in. Uh, this is accessible as a free download. Uh, so basically it's just giving you a little extra stuff for owning amiibo. The next thing that they talked about was Mario Maker. Uh, it is the 30th anniversary of Mario and Mario Maker will be launching in September. Uh, then they moved on to show Yoshi's Whirly, Whirly World? No, they went on to show Yoshi's Woolly World, uh, showing that it has two modes, Classic and Mellow. Classic being the regular difficulty, and then Mellow meaning that your Yoshi has wings and can fly. Uh, so basically so that you can get your, you know, your, your four-year-old or whatever to play it and be able to not get super frustrated. Um... Then they also released, and this was a, a pretty big surprise, that they're bringing out special yarn amiibos. So I think that they said that they're actually made of yarn. I'm not sure if that's true or not. If it if it's not true, then okay. But if it is true, how are these things going to hold up? Uh, after that, they went on and showed Splatoon. Um, they said that there's also that they're releasing two other. Um, uh, modes. One is ranked battle, which I don't see being terribly useful because you can't talk to your team. And then also the one that was more interesting to me is one versus one battles in the uh, Splatoon Battle Dojo. Uh, basically, one person is on the gamepad, the other is on the TV, and you are battling each other. But you you each have your own screen so that you can't see what the other person is doing. I assume the person who has the gamepad would probably face away from the TV or something. Uh, they then announced that Nintendo 64 and Nintendo DS games for the Wii U Virtual Console will be coming out. Uh, I think that they released two of them yesterday. I can't remember which ones they were. Um, then they talked about a few um, games like The Adventure of Pip, which looked like a retro platformer. Uh, they also talked about Octodad uh, coming to Wii, F Wii U, although I think if you were going to play this game, you probably would have already had it. Um, then they uh, said that they were going to release Mutant Muds, which is a, uh, or Mutant Muds Super Challenge, and that's cross-buy. So if you buy it on one system, you get it on both. Uh, then they said that you'll definitely be getting Don't Starve in May 2015. Um... It's really weird, but when you buy it, you get two copies so that you can give it to somebody else. So I, I imagine there's going to be a lot of places where people will be selling codes online for it for cheaper prices, uh, especially with the uh, low number of Wii U's out there. Uh, I'm glad to see more indie titles coming to Nintendo platforms. Um, Race the Sun looks really cool. But I think they should have brought it to 3DS instead of the Wii U because of the 3D. It's basically it's a flying game where you're flying into the screen, and um, and things are coming towards you. Uh, I think in 3D that would look really really great. The next announcement that they made was a Shin Megami Tensei Fire Emblem crossover. I've never actually played Shin Megami Tensei, but I played Fire Emblem Awakening, and I really really enjoyed that game. So. I'll probably pick up Shin, uh, the crossover, um, though I've looked at Shin Megami Tensei before and it looks really weird. Uh, they also said the horror game Fatal Frame is coming to the Wii U, and then they decided to go over a bunch of 3DS software. Um, they talked about Box Boy, which is a black and white puzzle platformer. It looked pretty cool. Um, basically... You are a box, and you can duplicate yourself in order to move around the stage. Uh, and then you can also make more boxes, and and they called it a, um, uh, oh, what was the word? The box afro. Or no, the afro shield is what they called it, which was very funny. Uh, basically, uh, you're the cube, and they created one, two, three, four, five, five cubes around the top of you. So that it was like your hair, and that was protecting you from spikes or whatever it is that was attacking you. Uh, Nintendo's bringing another Pokemon free-to-play game, although they call it free-to-download, trying to distance themselves from the words free-to-play. Uh, but they're bringing another one to the 3DS called Pokemon Rumble World. 
I actually bought Pokemon Rumble for the Wii U um, for my son. Uh, he likes it, but I found it to be a, a very, very dull button masher. But that's just for that's just me. Um, they t also talked about Puzzle Dragons, Puzzle and Dragons Z, as well as Super Mario Edition. Both come in the same box for thirty bucks, so you're getting two games for the price of one, according to Nintendo. That being said, they're really the same game, I think. Um, I watched somebody playing Puzzle and Dragons on Twitch the other day. I cannot imagine being good at it. Uh, the, the, like the, mo the quickness with the way that they were lining everything up on the screen was incredibly fast, and I have no idea how they could do it that quickly. Um, there's a, a demo available on May 22nd. Or, I'm sorry. The game comes out on May 22nd, and the d demo is available on April 30th. They're also going to be bringing Attack on Titan, which is based on an anime series, uh, to the new... Was it only the new 3DS, or was it just 3DS? I'm not sure. I think it was... They were bringing it to 3DS, but if you have the new 3DS, then it uses the C-Stick. Um, I've seen the first episode of that uh, show. It's bizarre and creepy. Uh, they talked about Codename Steam, and they they told fans to uh, rest assured that more Marth Amiibo will be coming in May. And the big news for Codename Steam is that they're adding a fast-forward button so that the alien turns... <coughs> <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, the alien turns don't take as long. Um, I've been actually holding off on buying that game just based on how long it took the aliens to do their moves in the demo. So this is definitely gonna, de going to make that game a lot more fun. They also announced some more Street Pass games. I don't really see the appeal of these, especially if you live in the U.S. where getting Street Passes is difficult. If you live in Japan where highly densely populated area where lots and lots of 3DSs are around, then um, these games are probably going to appeal to you a lot more. But as far as I'm concerned, these are uh, not something I would spend money on. Uh, there was a fishing game. Um, I think I, I call it Street Bass um, because I'm lame and I like lame jokes. Uh, there was a zombie game which looked a little meh. And then the actual, the, the weirdest thing that they announced yesterday out of everything was a Street Pass premium service that you actually have to pay for and it allows you to collect birthdays from people. So when you Street Pass from somebody and they have a birthday of April 2nd, that gets added to your list. So you want to fill in the whole calendar. Uh, by picking up everybody's birthday. I can't believe that this is a paid service, and I can't imagine anybody actually paying for this. Uh, but, you know, I've been wrong before. Uh, then they showed Xenoblade Chronicles 3D, a new trailer for it. Um, no real new information for it, but it comes out on April 10th. Um, I haven't even finished Majora's Mask yet, and I, I had pre-ordered Xenoblade Chronicles uh, a couple months ago, I think. So... That one's going to be coming, and I haven't finished Majora's Mask, and I'm going to have a backlog of games to play. Uh, they talked about the new Fire Emblem, which is coming in 2016. Um, the big deal with this one is that players get to create the protagonist. Uh, usually in a Fire Emblem game, you create a character that then controls the battlefield. You're not actually... Um, any of the characters down on the battlefield. Except for Fire Emblem Awakening... You create a character which was like a second protagonist, which just followed everybody around. Uh, this time, you're creating the protagonist of the game, and you get to choose whose side of the war you're on. So that means whichever side you play, uh, you're going to... Uh, you'll have two ways to play through. You can play through once on Team A, and then once on Team B. I don't remember what the teams were. Uh, they said that Team A... Uh, will be more uh, along the lines of the good guys, and it'll be a lot, um, a lot more similar to previous Fire Emblem games. And then the Team B, basically, you're working to take apart a corrupt system from the inside out, and they described it as being 
uh, more difficult and with a, uh, a more complex story. Uh, the next thing that they mentioned was an Animal Crossing game where you have to decorate people's houses and in order to get furniture for their houses you use amiibo cards. So basically like a Pokemon card but it has NFC in it and when you tap it on your uh, Wii U controller or your new 3DS or was it? Yeah, I think this was just for new 3DS uh, but I'm sure that they'll also have something with the Wii U. Um, either way, you tap it on your uh, amiibo enabled device and then you get you you claim what's on that card. Um, this seems kind of cool. I probably wouldn't spend money on it, but I guarantee my son's going to be asking me for them. Um, then the last thing that they announced was Mario Kart 8 DLC. Uh, they said that the uh, DLC will come out April 23rd. It'll come with um, three racers, four vehicles, and eight uh, courses. Uh, then they talked about a few of the courses, how uh, they're based on Animal Crossing, so the, there's going to be seasonal changes. Each time you load the course, it'll be a different season. And they also announced that they were going to be putting in 200cc, uh, where, and they said that braking is crucial, so it'll, it'll um, require more skill to play. Uh, I guarantee that I will be terrible at that. Uh, 150cc, I, I've got all the gold on all those, but I don't see myself getting... I don't see myself being competitive at 200cc, especially online. My question is, if it's running at 200cc, will it still run at 60 frames per second? That's one of the things that makes Mario Kart 8 look so absolutely fantastic, is that it runs incredibly smooth, 60 frames per second, even in split screen mode. So will they be able to run 200 CC in split screen mode at 60 frames per second? That's the that's the big question. Um, the 200 CC thing is free, and I don't know what the price is for the other DLC because I bought it a while ago. Um, that was Nintendo's Nintendo Direct for April 1st. So what do you guys think of the announcements? Do you think that these are good? Do you think they're bad? Do you find them to be meh? Email me at runjumpstomp at gmail.com or hit me up on Twitter at runjumpstomp. Okay, imagine for a second that you are a company traditionally dependent on cable companies. And you're making a TV show. And that TV show is aimed at people who like techie stuff. Unfortunately, many people who like techie stuff have gone away to college and never had cable. Um, some of them didn't even have cable growing up. And you need a way to entice those people to check out your new service, which does not depend on the cable company. This is what's happening with HBO. HBO has a show called Silicon Valley, and they want people to start watching that. So they have to entice people, the audience that it's aimed at, to come to their new HBO Now service, which is currently going to be exclusive on Apple TV. Uh, my guess is not for very long, but for now it's exclusive. And in order to get people to, to see that content, which they can't see because right now it's behind a paywall. Um, when I was a kid, every once in a while you would get two free weeks of HBO and my guess is that was the same thing. They wanted people to start watching their shows. They can't just offer two free weeks of HBO to everybody because not everybody has cable. So what they decided to do instead is go directly to the people who like this kind of content, and that's Twitch. They're going to be putting their show, the pilot episode, um, on Twitch. Four days before, they're going to put a clip 
of it on Twitch. And then they're going to have the cast sit down on Twitch for a live stream. And then they will air the pilot uh, in its entirety. Uh, prior to the Twitch premiere, the show's cast members will do that Q&A session. And I guess they're going to even play some video games uh, with John Carnage, who is the live programming director for Twitch. I think this is a pretty good move for HBO, and I know this is ne this is not necessarily gaming related, but it definitely piqued my interest. Cloud Gaming Service On Live was bought by Sony and is now finally shutting down. And in an FAQ, which they posted on their website, uh, they said, uh, what happens to my Play, play Pass games? Too bad, they're gone. Uh, what happens to my game save data and achievements? All gone after April 30th. Then they said, unless it was part of CloudLift, in which case the data can be transferred to Steam. But if it wasn't a CloudLift game, then that's not happening. Um, I bought a PC-only game under the assumption that I could play it on live on my Mac. Can I get a refund? No refunds are available. I bought an on-live game system or an on-live universal wireless controller. Does the hardware work with any other platforms? And then they said, no, it doesn't work with all, uh, any other platforms and no refunds are available. So be careful with these new cloud gaming services. Make sure that when you buy a game that you actually own it. Now, that being said, I buy a lot of stuff from Steam, and I don't actually own any of those games. So, should we go back to the disc? That's the question. I don't want to go back to the disc. I like having everything installed. I like not going to a store to buy something. I like buying something and being able to play it just a few minutes later. I don't want to go back to the disc. But do we have to? This week on The Long Play, I'm going to take a look at Obsidian Entertainment's Pillars of Eternity. It's an isometric, dungeon-crawling, role-playing game. Uh, I spent about 30 minutes just on character creation, which sounds dull, but I was having a lot of fun with it. Uh, they spent a lot of time and money crafting their world rather than buying one. And in previous games like this, the developers spent a bunch of money making sure that they had a good license to like Dungeons & Dragons or something like that. I'm really glad that this uh, particular game does not take place on the Sword Coast. Um, it has the normal selection of classes like a warrior or a rogue or a paladin, but then there's also weird classes like the Cypher, which I haven't played yet. Uh, there's also Chanters, which is kind of like a bar. That's the class that I went with. Uh, I made a Chanter. They, when you're playing them, they give out passive bonuses. Um, by using phrases. So when you're set up, uh, setting up your chanter, you pick a certain number of phrases and you can put them in order and you can make sure that they overlap. So when it finishes saying one phrase, which gives a certain passive bug, let's say maybe health regeneration, and then he stops and goes to another phrase, uh, so you'll always have like two phrases on your party um, at any one time. Uh, kind of like in EverQuest when the bard would uh, would twist their songs together in order to get multiple buffs on the party. Uh, as they use their phrases in combat, uh, they build up a combo meter. And once they hit a certain number of phrases, then they can cast a large spell that does something really cool. And you get to pick what the really cool thing is. Maybe you choose to summon a ghost, or maybe you summon a bunch of skeletons, or you can attack with lightning, or you can shout and knock all of the enemies I'm back. Effect back, or maybe knock them prone. Um, I'm playing on normal difficulty. When I first started, I, I actually stopped at the um, at the difficulty screen for a, a, a couple of 
couple of minutes trying to decide what I wanted to do. I almost picked hard because I've played these kind of games before, uh, and I I figured, oh, I could probably handle that. But then at the end, I decided I'll go with normal because I'm old and rusty. Um, I'm really glad that I went with normal and not hard. This game does not pull punches. Combat is involved. Uh, positioning is extremely important, and paying attention to which characters are engaged with which enemies is the key to winning. When you're when you're playing, pausing is your friend. You pause the game, you zoom in, and between the characters that are fighting, if you hover over them, they'll have like a little green circle around them, just like they did in Baldur's Gate or Icewind Dale. Um, and then there'll be a little like a rainbow-shaped line going from one character to the character that they're engaged with. And if it's a friendly character engaged with another character, then that would be a green line. If it's an enemy character engaged with one of yours, then it's going to be a red line. So you got to pay attention to where those red lines are. Because if, you're in, if your character is engaged and you try to move away, the enemies get a free hit. So you have to find a way to disengage um, and you could do that a few different ways. Um, one of the bonuses that I was that you can pick up when you level up um, is every character when you level up you have some class specific talents that you can pick, or there's then there's also generic offensive ones, generic defensive, and then generic um, I can't think of the word uh, utility. Uh, one of the generic defensive ones increases your disengagement defense, so as you move away from an engaged character, uh, your defense towards those types of attacks are higher and you're less likely to get uh, smashed. And something else that you could do is you could position a character, uh, maybe uh, your chanter, in just such a way that he can shout at the enemy, knock them down, now the engagement is over and you can move your character away. This kind of stuff makes combat extremely fun and nail-biting. So you hit that pause button and you got a lot of uh, uh, thinking to do. Then you unpause and you start to see what happens. Maybe the enemy starts moving in response to what you're doing, so you need to pause again and rethink uh, what you were going to do. It makes every fight different, and even if you're using the same abilities all the time, that positioning is what makes the, the, um, the fights engaging. Uh, the puzzles also are not throwaways. Very early in the game, you come across a puzzle. I'd say it's in the first dungeon. And if you don't pay attention, it's very easy to completely miss the clue that you would need to complete it. This happened to me. I did something or sold something, I won't get into it, but I called up a buddy of mine who also has the game, and he said, well, let's check this out. And I said, oh man, I think I got rid of that. So then I went back to the inn and I bought back the thing that I... Uh, had sold, and I was able to figure out between two or three different pieces of information how to solve this one puzzle. This might seem like a problem, and at the time when it was happening, I was a little irritated at the developers for making this puzzle so difficult. But when I finally figured it out, it made that moment really, really enjoyable. So I was really happy that they did not pull punches on these puzzles really really great and I highly recommend you play this game with a with a pencil and a piece of paper next to your mouse. Um, one of my main gripes with the game, uh, with, I'm sorry, one of my main gripes with games of this kind has even been addressed and that's inventory management. I hate inventory management in role-playing games. Uh, the way that they managed uh, to fix this is you constantly have access to a stash. So if your inventory is getting full, you can start putting stuff in the stash instead. If you prefer to have a more traditional RPG experience, you can turn this feature off. I really like that they give you the option because I never found inventory management to be fun in any uh, game. The graphics for this game look absolutely fantastic. The environments are really well made, and the characters look great when you zoom in during combat. Recently, I thought about playing Baldur's Gate again, and I loaded it up on my computer. Actually, it's Baldur's Gate 2, uh, the enhanced edition. I loaded it up on my computer, and it's awesome. I love it. 
but zooming in on those characters, are, they're, they're absolutely hideous. Uh, playing this, everything looks great. Uh, I'm really enjoying it, and the animations are fantastic. One of my characters has a muzzle loader uh, rifle, and when he shoots, and, uh, then he'll, he'll take a shot, then he sets it down on the ground, and pulls the stick out, uh, reloads the muzzle loader, and then pulls it back up and shoots again. And the animations are just fantastic. So to sum it up, this game is an awesome challenge with great uh, graphics. Uh, I'm about 10 hours in, but I've heard there's 60 to 70 hours of gameplay, and if you only and that's only playing through once. Uh, if you play through it multiple times, then as I'm sure many people who play this kind do, you're going to get hundreds of hours of entertainment uh, from Pillars of Eternity. So if you don't already have the game, go out and get it right now. Uh, it belongs on the shelf with Baldur's Gate, Icewind Dale, and Neverwinter Nights. It is that good. On the wish list this week is Axiom Verge. I think I'm saying that right. Uh, currently, it is an exclusive to the PS4. Uh, the quick summary of the game is it's an action-adventure game. Um, after a lab accident, a scientist awakens in a mysterious alien world. Is this a distant planet, the far future, or a complex virtual reality computer simulation? Uh, plumb the recesses of a large labyrinthine world in order to learn its secrets and uncover your role within it. Discover tons of weapons, items, and abilities, each with their own unique behaviors and usage. You'll need your wits to find them all and combat bizarre biomechanoid constructs, the deadly fallout of an ancient war, and the demons of your own psyche. And finally, break the game itself by using glitches to corrupt foes and solve puzzles in the environment. Alright, so this sounds really, really great. Um, it basically is a Metroidvania-style game, and um, currently it's exclusive to the PS4, but it, it Apparently it's going to be coming out on uh, PC in a few months, and when it comes out on PC, I'll definitely be picking it up. Uh, if you are interested in it at all, you could just Google Axiom Verge, or you can go to axiomverge.com, that's A-X-I-O-M-V-E-R-G-E.com, in order to find out more information about it. That's it for this week on Run Jump Stomp. Background music is If Pigs Could Sing by Roll Music and can be found at the link in the show notes. And if you want to be part of the show, uh, you can email me at runjumpstomp at gmail.com. You can also find me on Twitter, Twitch, and YouTube at runjumpstomp. Thanks for listening and have a great week. We'll see you next time.